Well, greetings, imagination connoisseurs. Once again, it is I, your Duke of Dope Discourse, your Viceroy of Verisimilitude, your Master of Fun and Wonder, and Tallulah. Your existential Mr. Rogers, Robert Meyer Burnett, here with Robservations, the show about something. <laughs> Robservations, number 324. Okay, Tallulah, I get it. I understand. You couldn't even let me stop talking before it was cookie time. I guess that's the case, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, you, imagination connoisseurs, you, members of this, the post-geek singularity community. And you know what that means. What, boy, I've got overzealous dogs here who are attacking me. Uh, you know, guys, it's really not helpful doing this. They're, they're all over me. <laughs> wow. Hey, you know, you, you, you're being rude. <laughs> You're being rude, dude. I understand. I mean, I get it. Let Tallulah have her cookie. Uh, you guys, you jumped the gun. You missed your mark. You know what I'm saying? You get, you get, I mean, it's it's nice to have you as part of the show. I mean it. But seriously, bro. Bruh. Okay, you gotta get down now. Yeah, that's good boy. Yeah, good boy and good girl. I mean, I say please, and I say thank you to these dogs, and sometimes I feel like... Anyway, where was I? <laughs> Welcome to Observations, episode number 324. And of course, Observations is the show about something coming to you, you imagination connoisseurs, you who make up this, the post-geek singularity community. Hey, you're being a little... She's been a little uh, squirrely all day, so I have to... I have to apologize for that. You know what, Tallulah? Uh, I don't understand if I have to give her a new cookie or what. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, as I've I've often said to you, I've asked uh, fans and members of this community to send me videos, to send me uh, anything you want, and I would like to play it on the show. Well, I was sent a video from one of our viewers, longtime viewer, of his rebel basement, and you know what? Wow, I'm going to show that to you right now. Hopefully, I'll be able to stop her from barking. Hello, Rob Bo here from near St. Louis, Missouri, part of the Post Geek Singularity community since the beginning. Big fan of yours for a number of years as well. And I thought I'd show you a quick tour of my Rebel basement. I remember the weekend the original Star Wars premiered. My older brother rushed home after he and one of his buddies snuck into the theater to catch it, and he told me I have got to go back with him to watch it. I was seven years old, and it blew me away. Fast forward a few years, when my wife and I were building our home, I asked her if I could have a Star Wars basement. She told me I could as long as I kept it classy and not just have all my toys and action figures cluttering up the space. So while my original Kenner X-Wing, TIE Fighter, and Millennium Falcon may be tucked away in storage, I made the most of this space with my other collectibles. Starting in the mid-90s when Star Wars entered its resurgence, I began hunting down uh, the original theatrical posters. I also stumbled upon a few early internet forums that uh, provided instructions on how to build the prop lightsabers and blasters from the exact parts the film used pieces were made from. Then when uh, companies like Master Replicas received licenses to you know, produce prop replicas, my collection took off from there. I'm also attracted to pre-production material from the original trilogy. Storyboards, concept art, press kits, and the like. Uh, it's a thrill to get a hold of items created behind the scenes for just a few folks instead of uh, all those churned out products that go out to the masses.
Snickers as my comfort food. And it's nice to be able to come down here alone or with neighbors and friends and be surrounded by what has given me so much joy over the past 40 plus years. I think that's important for anyone, no matter what you like to collect or whatever makes you happy. Be it a single statue, toy, or classic book, to dozens or even hundreds of items, uh, you know, classy or cluttered. If it uh, brings you joy, make a little room for it in your life. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that comes from Bo Sanders in St. Louis, Missouri. And I, I got to say, you know, when I ask people to send me videos and things like that, um, I this is this was overwhelming. Obviously, Bo put a lot of time into that. By the way, he the music that he did use was YouTube approved music, which I very much appreciate. And obviously, a lot of time went into that video. Um, so... Bo has certainly stepped up the bar for all of you. So I, again, I mean, I'm I'm overwhelmed and uh, touched that he would take the time to make this. But I, I, it's kind of exactly what I was what I was hoping for. What a cool glimpse into our fellow imagination connoisseur's life. And kudos to his wife for letting him build a <laughs> a, um, a a Star Wars Rebel basement. <laughs> How great is that? What a very cool video. So I want to thank him for uh, sending that in. So, Bo, thank you very much. But, again, for all of you people out there, I really encourage anybody, all of you imagination connoisseurs, any members of this, the Post Geek Singularity, to send in your videos. Because how cool is that? And um, I've never even been to St. Louis except into the airport. So, you know, to get a glimpse to know what collectors are doing and how they're they're displaying their stuff. I noticed, Bo, that you you have a one sheet. You have what's called the Star Wars Birthday One Sheet, which I actually have here in the Rob Observatory, which was a poster they released to special theaters um, when Star Wars had played for a year, first run. And basically, it was the first 12 Kenner Star Wars action figures surrounding a birthday cake that said one year old today. It's a pretty rare poster and it's definitely uh, not a cheap poster. It was nice to see that you had one of those. I I always respect anybody that has a real Star Wars birthday poster. So kudos to you for that. Now one of the things that I, you know, I'm always trying to find interesting topics to, to deal with or to discuss and I read something today in Variety that I thought was fairly interesting. If I can uh, get it back to where I had it so I could read it on my... Um, uh, I'll, I'll actually have to... I think I have to fix with that little... Uh, <laughs> Tallulah sent me sent me a little, uh, a little askew for a minute there. I'm going to see if I can get, um, get back where I was here uh, so I can get the... Um, get back my <laughs> what I what I wanted to be looking at which I couldn't find so let's see if I can get that back on to where I wanted it and I did so this was an article that was in daily variety today and I found it particularly interesting and I wanted to make it the topic of this show because as a lot of people uh, may or may not know China, the Middle Kingdom has become incredibly important in terms of Hollywood box office. Now, it is, it's obviously a, a huge country with their uh, a booming economy and a bunch of um, movie fans out there. They, they're, they're, they support 3D. They're building theaters like there's no tomorrow. Basically, it's, it's an emergent, it's still an emergent economy, even though it's it's eventually will probably dominate the globe. But what I found really interesting about this particular um, 
article that I want to read is that Lulu Wang, who directed this, made a, a, a film about her Chinese immigrant family and her experience here in America. And yet Chinese audiences did not gravitate toward it. And I, I, I saw it sort of as an interesting, an interesting commentary on, we always talk about inclusion and diversity. And I, I've talked about on this show that um, there, we've talked about how there's not a lot of, like as everyone knows, I'm a big fan of Sun Kang and the character of Han from the Fast and the Furious franchise. And Justin Lin, who directed Star Trek Beyond, and of course he's directing the new Fast and Furious movies, and he directed four previous installments, including the Citizen Kane of the franchise, Fast Five. But he began making things like Better Luck Tomorrow uh, and Shopping for Fangs, which were indie films that that were were spearheaded or or the the uh, they were starring Asian Americans. But what I've always found interesting, and there's a lot of talk about inclusion and diversity in this country, and I'm, as you know, at the forefront of that, saying that the more voices that we have, the more people that are speaking out and sharing their experiences, the better off we all are. So I love it when we see people that have not had as much of a voice in Hollywood joining the Hollywood system and, and creating movies about their own experience. But what I've always thought was sort of strange, at least to me, was the idea of, of if you're Asian in the United States and your parents were first generation immigrants, I, uh, of course, um, Willow Yang could speak to this. What happens is there's a hybridization that occurs. It's a new experience. When you immigrate to a different country and you start to assimilate and you have children that are born in this country, it's different than just being Chinese. You've now become an immigrant and the assimilation into that new culture becomes part of your new experience. So when people are talking about they want more Asian voices to be seen in, in film, and I certainly do, what they're talking about is that the hybridization, the, the voice that someone who's now living in America is going to bring. And that's that's a new voice that's not entirely Chinese anymore. It's about the experience of being, say, the son or daughter of a Chinese immigrant family and then being born in America or being Chinese and then immigrating here and growing up. It changes your experience. And um, obviously, I, to be uh, honest, I have not seen The Farewell, but everyone who has talked to me about it says that it is an amazing movie, and I really want to see it. And of course, uh, Lulu Wang um, is a new female filmmaker, a female director. It's starring Aquafina, who won the Golden Globe for Best Actress, and uh, it's every, by, everyone has told me what a wonderful film it is and how heartfelt it is. But I found this article interesting. I did not know how the farewell had done in China, and so reading this today fascinated me. Uh, the Farewell has flopped in China with a dismal $261,000 opening weekend gross and accumulation, a cumulative uh, total of $580,000 so far, once again proving the difficulty of creating content that resonates equally on both sides of the Pacific. Even when a story is set in China, features Chinese talent, and unfolds primarily in Mandarin. Although the film was distributed directly by Mao Yan, one of China's two top online ticketing platforms, The Critical Darling, made a paltry $78,000 on opening day, January 11th, 2020, accounting for just 1% of the country's total screenings. Shows were, on average, only 0.5% occupied. The firm's own data showed, and opening day was its best day. Percentages of daily total screenings dropped even further since. As it entered its second weekend, The Farewell had dropped to a dismal 25th at the box office. In another week, it will be utterly swallowed by a swarm of big local blockbusters coming out for Chinese New Year. Only like 70,000 people in all of China have seen our film. It's a bit ridiculous, lamented the China side producer Jane Zhang. Uh, actor Zima, who plays Aquafina's father in the film, likely echoed the thoughts of much of Hollywood when he told Variety that he was really surprised at the outcome. I was almost assuming that they wouldn't even see this as a foreign film. Really, there's only two Americans cast in the entire thing. In a country where kids are often raised by their grandparents, he expected it to hit home a lot more in China than anywhere else. 
The failure to do so makes the film one of the most interesting case studies of Asian Hollywood's content crossover potential since 2018's Crazy Rich Asians. That rom-com made $238 million globally and was hailed as a milestone for Asian American representation in the U.S., but it crash-landed with less than $2 million in China where many people found it difficult to relate to and took offense at what they felt was an overly stereotypical depiction of Asian families and values. Based on the real-life experience of China-born American director Lulu Wang, the more intimate and down-to-earth, The Farewell has nevertheless also failed to connect with the broad Chinese public. Contributing factors include a mixed response to its Chinese ness and a botched marketing approach that failed to convince exhibitors to take a chance on the title. The film's original release date was moved from late November to January in hopes of avoiding tougher competition and riding the U.S. awards season wave, but Oscar nominations ultimately failed to materialize. It was very, very difficult to prove to cinemas that there are people who want to watch it. Without that, even people who want to watch the film won't be able to find a screening nearby, Zhang said. We were quite conservative about how it would do in China, and we did think with Aquafina's Best Actress Golden Globe win, it would do better. Working with Malian, the title got a bit lost in the shuffle. Malian failed to do more stylized or customized promotion that could have given a targeted boost to an unusual film that lacked any locally known stars, Zhang admitted. Uh, Malian has so many films that are distributing in any single period that this was definitely not one of their main projects. But you shouldn't overlook the specificities of each film, she said. There was an over-reliance on big data which indicated the audience would be young urban women ages 20 to 29 in first and second tier cities. We could have reached out to a wider audience base because to me, this is a film for all age groups and all generations, said Zhang. At least one scene in the Chinese version was censored. It concerned a story told by the mother of Aquafina's character at a banquet about how an American church opened its doors to her daughter and let her use their pianos when the family couldn't afford one of their own. From a content perspective, local audiences seem to have deemed the farewell too Chinese to be accepted as a bearer of its American values, and yet too American to be accepted as genuinely Chinese. Director Wang clearly anticipated this sort of reaction even before the China release. On the red carpet of the Golden Globe, she told Variety, I do think this film is a little bit more Chinese than Crazy Rich Asians, but it's still told through the perspective of an American woman. Despite a truly, a really tremendous response so far, she felt, viewers would see that it's not really a fully Chinese movie, concluding, I'm really interested to see how they respond to that. Responses have, in the end, been mixed. The title has garnered a lackluster 7.3 out of 10 on the taste-making review site Dubon, and a relatively poor 8.4 out of 10 on Mao Yan's more populous platform. Many online reviews from viewers have gushed over how recognizable many of the characters and family dynamics felt to them, saying it made them cry or even decide to go home early for Chinese New Year. I felt like I was at my own family's gathering or wedding or tomb sweeping. This film is too real, one Dubon commentator wrote. But conversely, the familiarity has also bred a feeling of so what? The banter scenes and visuals that give the farewell its charm for American audiences lack novelty for most mainland viewers. The humor is from Lulu's perspective, so a lot of it is just too normal for us. Things that just happen every day. Do we find it funny? Yes. But maybe less so, Zhang said. Other common Uh, Other common comments critiqued everything from Aquafina's looks, which differ sharply from cliched Chinese beauty standards, to the depiction of Changchun. The city where the story is set was even seen as too old-fashioned and so portraying a backward image of China. When a Chinese story is told by so-called non-Chinese, a non-Chinese person, some people here immediately build up a defensive wall, saying that this is not your story. You don't have the right to tell it, said Zhang. There's this instant response that this isn't, can't be authentic. That this, that this can't be authentic. It's a spirit she predicts will carry through to Disney's Mulan, which should give Disney pause, manifesting in similarly very negative and nasty comments. Independent critic Yu Yaquin further explained people's dissatisfaction. Chinese culture and Chinese people today are really complicated and have all sorts of differing values. This film wasn't as bad as Crazy Rich Asians, but it still oversimplified things. Furthermore, the topics of cultural difference between China and America and of American-born Chinese 
identify are ones that current mainland audiences don't understand and really aren't interested in. Another Dubon reviewer described the disconnect by saying, It's not surprising the film is getting the cold shoulder. China, in the eyes of foreigners, is always more Chinese than China in the eyes of Chinese people. Uh, I thought that was a really interesting something I, you know, I might have thought about, but not really dealt with head on. And the idea that that it's as we become a more global society and as we uh, are beginning to tell stories of those people that haven't had their stories told before on the big screen, on one hand, I think we are getting uh, it's always a good thing to get new voices and hear the stories of people because Lulu Wang's film is clearly very personal to her and she's telling a story that I certainly uh, know many people identify with here in America, but it's very interesting to think that we in America have something necessarily to say to Chinese audiences. Once again, I think we have, you know, there's all this talk of entitlement. Certainly we as Americans, and I mean all Americans, immigrant families, people that have lived here for generations, um, we do have a sense of American entitlement that something, I mean, the American experience must be valuable for everybody, right? Isn't that the way it is? Um, but in this case, it wasn't. And the fact that uh, a movie didn't do well, I, I, I never like it when a film isn't successful. But it's going to be very interesting. This article brought up Mulan. And I know that Disney is hoping that Mulan does very, very well with the Chinese audience. But this article points out that, hey, wait a minute. Who are you people to co-opt this story? I mean, Disney, Disney's been co-opting other countries' stories since they've been around. But if you expect a movie like Mulan, and by the way, I think Mulan looks great. I'm talking about the live-action Mulan. But again, it's a very Chinese story that also has been told uh, by the Chinese in films of their own. And as I've said to people, I grew up as a fan of Asian cinema. And we talked yesterday, I was asked uh, by a viewer, what was my favorite Shaw Brothers movie? And I had mentioned Inframan, because Inframan was a, a science fiction. I know it's an Ultraman ripoff, but I really liked uh, Inframan is, is goofy fun, or the Shaw Brothers, the Super Inframan is what it was called when it came out in America. It was released as Inframan. I like the movie so much that I have a one sheet for it, framed one sheet that is hanging here in our house, and uh, that's how much I like that movie. But I grew up loving uh, Asian cinema, whether it was Japanese, whether it was Korean. Korean cinema I came to late, but uh, I've come to love it. There's been, the last 10 years has been have been such a a great, glowing, vibrant period in terms of Korean cinema. And then, of course, Chinese cinema I've loved for a very long time. And I'm always waxing rhapsodic about my love of people like Tony Leung and Chow Yun-Fat and Gong Li and Maggie Chung. And I, one of my favorite directors of all time is Wong Kar Wai. And, um, you know, not a lot of people in America know these films. And it's interesting. We're so quick now to talk about inclusion and and um, hearing people's voices, and yet we're not so fast to go actually delve into the cinema f from those countries. I mean, India is still the largest film industry in the world. When was the last time anybody watched an Indian movie? Now I know, especially in this country. Now I know uh, there's movies like something like Robot will come out, and I'm just as guilty. My knowledge of Bollywood cinema, I mean, look, Saji Ray and all that, I saw the Apu trilogy, you know, there was that was art house films from decades ago, but I don't, I am not up. Uh, you know, Ashawara Rai, whatever. I mean, her certain certain people. I own Lagan. I love Lagan. Uh, it's a it's a three hour movie about cricket. If you haven't seen Lagan, it's quite good. But that was released domestically, and and I I just think that we Americans uh, we should really begin to broaden our horizons. And I think one of the most interesting things about watching foreign movies, especially when you're not watching genre films, when you're not watching, say, Chinese movies about the triads or something like that, is, you know, when you watch more quiet films or, or films that deal with, with everyday life, you learn things about everyday customs that are very different 
movies can give us a, a, an understanding. We don't even know that we're learning things about another culture, but we are. And I found it found it very interesting that this movie, The Farewell, did not do so well in China. And by all accounts, from everybody I've talked to, um, people that are, are Chinese or non-Chinese have loved this movie. And um, I find that to be very, very interesting. Uh, I think as we all move forward and expect... Are we all want American movies to penetrate into foreign lands? And of course, the Chinese box office is incredibly important. A lot of movies make back money. Movies like Pacific Rim did, in, my beloved Pacific Rim, did incredibly well in China. And because of the success, they were able to make a sequel. Now, I wasn't nearly as much a fan of the sequel as I was of the original, but. If, if the movie didn't hit in China, it would not have been made. And I'm happy that there's more than one Pacific Rim movie because that means more Pacific Rim action figures and toys and things I love. So that's always a good thing. But it's always very interesting. And we always have to be mindful of when you're trying to sell movies to other cultures, there are things about those other cultures that we just don't know and we can't take for granted. And I think it's really important. I think the more people watch films or experience entertainment from around the world, the better off we here in America are going to be. I've always said that that I think I've read a statistic once now that only 65% of Americans or 65% of Americans don't have a passport and never have had a passport and they haven't traveled. And other countries, especially when you go to Europe, you jump on a train, you're in another country where they speak a different language in mere hours. And, of course, you could go over the border to Mexico, but most of North America, of course, is English-speaking. And it, it's hard. I, I, you know, I think the idea of Star Trek, boldly go where no one has gone before, I've always believed that you should boldly go where you haven't gone before because it only is broadening your horizons and that can always or not, it can never be a bad thing. So, um, yeah, I just thought this was an interesting subject uh, to ponder. And I don't know what it all means. It just surprised me. I don't know what you guys think. It's not necessarily normally my bill of fare here on the show, but it is an important industry concern, and I wanted to share it with all of you. So, what do you guys think? I'll be very curious. Uh, people have sent me tips. People have sent me super chats. Uh, the Master of Odin sent in a tip. Thank you, Master of Odin. With the upcoming Picard show, do you think that we will get any reference to the events we saw in Star Trek 09? To be specific, the whole Spock, Red Matter storyline, are they going to ignore it? Well, uh, Master of Odin, I can say absolutely not. They're not going to ignore it. It's a big part. Star Trek 09... Um, we talk about it being the Kelvin verse, but what you have to remember is that Star Trek 09 and its companion comic book, Countdown, which they've now done again, IDW put out the Countdown comic book, which was a prequel to Star Trek 09, where you see Data, Captain Data, you see Picard, you see the Hobus Stargo supernova destroying Romulus, and you get a backstory with Nero and where did he come from and all of that, that is vital to what happens in Star Trek Picard because uh, people forget that Kurtzman and Orsi did address the writers. I mean, Kurtzman obviously in Secret Hideout runs Star Trek now, but they also co-wrote Star Trek 09 and the Countdown comic was set in the Next Generation era and dealt with the destruction of Romulus. So that Countdown comic, and now IDW is publishing another Countdown comic, 11 years or 10 years 11 years later, where it's dealing with, it's a prequel comic to the Picard series, and by all accounts, a lot of that does in fact play into where we're at at the beginning of Picard. So, absolutely it does. So yeah, uh, Willow sent in a tip, has human religion become obsolete in the Star Trek universe? I know they had a Christmas party in the original series, but a lot of atheists and non-Christians also celebrate the holiday. Well, there was an episode called, in the second season of the original series, called Who Mourns for Adonais, which is famously the episode where Apollo, the Greek god Apollo, shows up and and uh, holds the Enterprise in place with his hand. Um, and I think 
And th- there's a there is a, a moment in that where Kirk mentions that in terms of gods, we find the one quite sufficient. But for the most part, I think that it's understood. I think religion is probably respected in the 23rd century or the 24th century, but I don't think there are many. I don't think religion holds sway over people the way it does now. Um, I think as you move out amongst the stars, uh, I I think that people who are deeply religious would have to confront what it all means. Like once you step out into the heavens and start meeting, what happens when if you're devoutly religious and you meet a group of people or humanoids that have no – they don't believe in the one true God or whatever. Uh, they don't believe in the God of the Old and the New Testament. They don't. They have no crucifixion myth. They have no savior myth. How would you deal with that? How would you then have to come to grips with all of these other life forms? How would that fall into your worldview? Uh, how come our Bible didn't mention those people? Uh, and I think it would be very interesting to see, and there's a lot of that, uh, Michael Faber's book, The Book of Strange New Things, which I highly recommend. He wrote Under the Skin as well. The Book of Strange, Strange New Things is about a missionary. Well, one of the stories is about a missionary, a devout missionary, who goes to a planet and deals with the indigenous alien population, and it deals with that very issue. So I think, Willow, by the way, it's a great question, but Gene Ronberry was a secular humanist. I don't necessarily, I, I guess he was probably an atheist, um, definitely a secular humanist. And I think that in the Star Trek future, religion exists. I mean, Deep Space Nine, of course, delves into the whole Bajoran people and their prophets, or as we know them, the wormhole aliens. Uh, I thought it did a really good job. It gets a little overt a number of times, but um, the fact that the the wormhole aliens, or as the Bajorans call them, the prophets, and the prophets are worshipped by the Bajoran people, they're not wrong in worshipping the wormhole aliens. They call them the prophets, they don't call them gods, but they were there, and they were real, and they're non-corporeal, and they exist outside of the regular frame of, of, of time and space, so, I mean, it shows that faith isn't necessarily misplaced. And I think one of the things about the, and also Next Generation, there were many episodes that dealt with faith and religion. Um, I don't necessarily think that um, um, it has become obsolete. It's just, I don't think it's it, it has as much sway as our religion does over us today. But it's a good question. Definitely a good question. Um Darth Sidious sent in a tip and said, Hi, Rob. Which anime do you think would be a better idea for a full-length movie franchise? My Hero Academia or Galactic Football? And when I say football, I mean the European sport. I think My Hero Academia, probably. To be honest, I haven't seen Galactic Football. I've only heard about it. I've not watched it. But I don't know about an anime about, well, Galactic Football. Maybe it could be good. I would just assume. But again, it's not really fair to me to say without the compare and contrast. But My Hero Academia is, I think, really, really good. I think it would appeal to a lot of different kinds of, of fans. Uh, maybe Galactic Football would, but I'm not sure about that. Uh, Alexander Wilson sends in a tip. David Chen, an American Chinese film pundit, said the entire movie, The Farewell, is about how Chinese Americans find Chinese customs strange and alienating. A movie like that would not do well box office wise in China. Well, Alexander, a great point. Um, yeah, I, 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 that, that's the whole thing. I mean, I think they're, they're, in a nutshell, there you go. Um, that explains it. And I, I think, uh, Again, the the immigrant experience, whatever country you immigrate to, it it changes you. You can't help but become a hybridization of the country you left or the country that you're from, and then the country that you move to, and and I think that's what's that's what's sort of happening with with humanity and has been for a long time, obviously. But now with communications technology being what it is, and and jet travel is commonplace. I mean, 50 years ago, people weren't traveling the globe the way they are now. So it's a fairly new phenomenon in human history, and I, I think it's it's going to change, and that's how we learn about each other, and and it's going to be interesting to see how our 
how nationalism and borders and things change. I mean, I, I kind of wish I could live for another, I wouldn't mind living for another 500 years just to see what's happening. Where, where do we all go? I mean, from, from 500 years, the, the 500 years before the 20th century, there was a lot of technological advance, but, but certainly in the 20th century and now in the 21st century, the rapid technological advancement that's progressing in, in computer science and medical technology. I mean, who knows where it's going to lead us? I wish I, I wish I was, uh, I wish I was around to see it, but you're right. And, um, Absolutely. Jeffrey Mao uh, sends in a tip and says, imagine how well a movie made in China about the American Revolution (laughs) or the Civil War would do here, and you get an idea of how well Mulan will do in China. A very, very good point. I mean, I don't think we as as Americans, I mean, I know that it's, it's hard. I've never been. I've been to South Korea. I went over to work on a documentary in 2018, but I've never been to to China. I've I've always wanted to go to Hong Kong and mainland China. My mom has been there. My mom's been all over uh, Asia. She's been to Japan. She's been to China. She's been to Vietnam. She's been to Cambodia. Um, she's been to Hong Kong, but I've never been to any of those places, and I've always wanted to go. I know it's not just to see uh, Hot Toys Secret Base, although I'm not going to deny I would go there, absolutely go there. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, yes, I would. But I really want to go. But, uh, Jeffrey, you're absolutely right. I mean, first of all, you know, it's a famous story. And it'd be, it'd be, like, it'd be like the Chinese making a story about Lewis and Clark or the Alamo. And what's interesting is there have been a lot of Asian remakes. There's an Asian remake. There's a Japanese remake of Unforgiven. And, of course, the Man With No Name movies, remakes of, of Yojimbo, Sanjuro, uh, at least a uh, fistful of dollars and for a few dollars more. So there has been, there has been cross promotional um, or not cross promotional, but cross, we, we've respected one another by remaking certain movies. But the idea that Disney, I understand making an animated movie like Mulan or something like that, but live action, it's going to be very different. We'll see how it, how it, how it works out, but you're right, Jeffrey. Uh, I don't know. Stubble McShave sent in a tip. I, I can understand if the Chinese have problems with a modern Hollywood depiction. I suspect that a Hollywood movie portraying a Swedish family would ring false in my ears and probably overdo some cultural aspects, similar to the Uncanny Valley, but for culture. That's really interesting, Stubble. You know, I was fascinated. I'm a huge fan of the Dragon Tattoo trilogy. Um the Elizabeth Salander trilogy. I, I I really loved the Swedish version of Girl Girl uh, with a Dragon Tattoo. As much as I love David Fincher as a filmmaker, I didn't think it was nearly as good as the Swedish version, especially the longer version that, thank God, they released on home entertainment, home video, on Blu-ray, the extended cuts of all three Dragon Tattoo films. And I, I just didn't think it held up. I thought there was something in those movies that were sort of baked in, about the 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 mindset, and I I agree with you. I I think it's so strange when Americans make movies set in other countries that star the protagonists. I mean, I know that that Craig Mazin. As much as I loved Chernobyl, and I loved Chernobyl, um, it wasn't made by Russians. Obviously, I don't think it would have been made the same way. But it, it's strange, and and then you hear the Russian feedback on it. Uh, it's probably not wrong, but you know, we Americans have a long history of telling the stories of other countries and bending them to our, our way, our will. (laughs) Anonymous sent in a tip and says, I just saw Star Crash on Amazon Prime. I think I've seen this once before, but I liked it much better this time. That's not to say it has a lot of flaws. Well, what Anonymous is talking about is I have a, a, a great big love for an Italian Star Wars ripoff, Star Wars clone called Star Crash that stars Caroline Monroe, David Hasselhoff, yes, Marjorie Gortner as a robot, and the, the late, great Joe Spinell as Count Zartharn. It even has Christopher Plummer in it. It is just a really goofy bargain basement Star Wars clone, but it has a lot of verb and it, verb and it borrows from everyone, from Ray Harryhausen, to, it borrows from invaders from Mars. I mean, it 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 borrows liberally from the whole history of American science fiction movies, 
And I mean, I love it. I, I can even pick out what model parts they use from which models for their spaceships, and I, I don't care. I would not call it a good movie. I know Mystery Science Theater did a version of it, which I was very mad about, but what can you do? Uh, I do adore it, and it's got a John Barry score that's actually very good, so absolutely. Um, John, <laughs> John Hiroshi says, I forgot to put my name on the Star Crash thing. Haha, <laughs> well, John, I'm glad you watched Star Crash. I'm, gave, I'm glad you gave it the love it deserves, because it does deserve some love. Mark C. says, Mark Chire says, is it that Americans are entitled or that the Chinese are oppressed and told how to think? I think we push into Chinese entertainment as if they are free. Well, I mean, it's not like the Chinese, sure, they, they're they a communist country. They have a totalitarian regime. But even even the, the even China is a very I mean I can't speak to it I've only I've only observed it from the outside but it's not like the Chinese people aren't living in incredible urban environments that they don't have a burgeoning technology sector uh, I I, uh, I I wouldn't exactly say they're not like North Korea they're not <laughs> they're you know they're not starving so I, I don't I, I sure. They're, uh, they are oppressed to a certain extent, but not oppressed like, say, the, the, the Russians were during uh, uh, the, uh, the, the communist revolution, the Soviet Russia. I don't think they're – it's all changing. Um, so, But you never know. I mean, I don't know, to be honest. That's a really good question. Americans are entitled. We, we, we've always had that mindset. And I think on one hand it serves us well because the great thing about um, Americans – is that Americans will be like, we can go to the moon. And we will. <laughs> you know, we'll think stuff up and do it. One of the, I'll tell you, one of the one of the, the stories that I that happened to me when I was in Bulgaria producing the Hills Run Red back in 2008 at the hotel that I was staying in, they had the the piano bar, um, which was an interesting place. But there was a, a girl that ran the piano bar. She was very good at it. She it wasn't her bar, but she ran the. She was behind the bar. She was a bartender, and she ran the bar, and we became friends. Her and her boyfriend, uh, they would take me out and show me around. And she said something. I said to her one day, "I go, you don't want to. What, what do you want to do? Do you want to work at the this hotel bar? Or, I mean, do you like that?" And she said, "No, my boyfriend and I want to open our own place. We want to open our own restaurant." And I go, "That's great. You guys would be great. You, you should do that. That'd be awesome." And she looked at me, and she was like. Nobody in Bulgaria would ever say that. Say that, and I said, "Well, what do you mean?" She goes, "Nobody in Bulgaria would say you should open." They would say, "Oh, you can't do that. We don't have the mindset in this country that we can just think something up and do it." And I realized that was the first time it was a. Uh, it was something that I realized then and there what America has that we completely take for granted, and that we never we never really think about. But that is the fact that here in this country. If you have the wherewithal and you you want to do it, you can think something up and go make it happen. Not only that, if if you have the right personality and the right idea, not only can you think something up and go make it happen, you can get other people to come help you and say, that sounds like it's a great idea. You know, I mean, we have that ability here. And I think that's something that maybe is, is the thing that gives us the most strength. We're always trying to export these ideas of democracy. But when I was in... Bulgaria, it made me realize that when the wall fell in the Soviet Union and we could get over there, we should have sent a bunch of people over and and showed showed people in, in Russia or in satellite countries like Bulgaria, show them how to do things like achieve their dreams. Like, what can we do to help you? Because I think that's sort of uniquely American and we tend to forget that we aren't the most important people in the world and people don't think the way we do. And I think that's why I'm, I'm always saying that... that um, um, Every person you meet has a story to tell you have yet to hear. I say, I'm going to say at the end of this broadcast again. And I think it's important. I think that we should remember that, that there's all kinds of people in the world, but the one thing that I think that is unique to America, the one thing that we should be exporting, because, you know, you can't convince people who've never experienced democracy or even really know how it works to some, suddenly create a democratic uh, government. What you do is... If somebody wants to become a baker and they want to have a bakery, 
You help them to have a bakery. You help a dressmaker start a dress shop. You start somebody who wants to sell a hard, have a hardware store or a cheese shop or whatever people want to do in terms of being entrepreneurs. And you know what? You help them open their own businesses. And then once they start opening their own businesses, they're going to want parking. They're going to want sidewalks. They're going to want garbage pickup. They're going to want all of those things that an infrastructure will bring them. And, and democracy will grow out of that. And, and um, well, at least here on a show about <laughs> entertainment, it's easy for me to say that. Look, I am, I am, I'm, I'm by no means, you know, like I've said before, I'm not someone like John Kenneth Galbraith. I don't know how all of these things work, but uh, I can only say from my own experience how uh, the, the kinds of people that, I, that I've met and the experiences that I've had. But yes, I think Americans are pretty entitled. But you know what? Our American you know, the smiles we put on our faces and like, yeah, man, let's go do that. I think that's something we have in America that's pretty special. And, and um, if we would just shut up for a while and listen to what other people are doing, I mean, when I say shut up, this coming from somebody who sits and talks at you for two hours a day, but you know what I mean? So maybe so. Mark, see, it's a good question. Um, <laughs> Paul Gilmore sent in a tip. And said, "Where's the beef? Where's the beef? Does everybody? Does anybody remember that? The those were old Wendy's commercials. Where's the beef? Those are pretty funny. I'm sure they're on YouTube." Uh, Paul Gilmore also says, uh, "Time to make the donuts." <laughs> Alexander Wilson comes back and says, "The actress that plays Mulan in the live action movie supported the Chinese government against the Hong Kong supporters." A lot of people are saying the Chinese government has invested in the live action movie and it will do crazy business in China. I I don't know if that's true, but it will be interesting to say. Um, Stubble McShave says, since you were kicked out of Campia's show before you could comment, how tingly are you in your pants after the comments about that new Dune movie and it's compared to Lord of the Rings and the original Star Wars and how much of an impact it will have on movie culture? Well, for those of you who don't know, and yes, for whatever reason, um, I was connected with John Campia. We the show was going perfectly well, and then suddenly, I don't know what happened. I was kicked off. My Skype connection was blown out, and I couldn't get back on. And I did get on briefly, and then I was kicked out again. So I, I that has never happened before. I've never been booted out of Skype like that. I have no idea what happened, but craziness. But the question was, apparently there was a sci-fi writer who was commenting, or some writer, about how they saw footage from Dune. I guess there's some kind of a sizzle reel going around, which which makes sense. I mean, the movie is supposed to come out this year, um, and it's not unheard of for exhibitors or people to see uh, early, early material. Well, I am, as we say on the John Campy show, Ghibli. I am Ghibli with desire to see Dune. I cannot wait to see it. My God... Uh, it's my most eagerly awaited film of the year. I love the books, as I've said, and to hear that Dune is is good uh, is amazing. I cannot wait. I mean, honestly, I really cannot wait to see Dune. I'm I'm so very 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 excited. Um, you know, I don't even know. I, I I'm beside myself. I am very excited to see it. And who isn't? I mean, but I wouldn't expect Denis Villeneuve, you know, Denis Villeneuve, as far as the science fiction movies are, are, are go, between Arrival, Blade Runner 2049, and um, I'm hoping Dune, the man has, has brought me much delight, and he's an incredible world-class filmmaker, and I think it's uh, pretty great. So, yeah, uh, I, I'm interested. Um... Let's see. I'm going to start reading some letters now. This one comes from Richard Aldrich. Hello, Rob. Today was my introduction to you and what in... Oh, wait. I think I already read this. I did read this, but... Um, uh, oh, no. Maybe not. Uh, but I think I might have. Uh, by the way, I've learned that I've been saying Colin Trevorrow's name wrong. It's not Colin Trevorrow, like I was saying a million times in my review. So, Mr. Trevorrow is not correct. It's Colin Trevorrow. I was corrected. Hello, Rob. Today was my introduction to you, and what an introduction it was. I'm a huge Star Wars fan, and I have a request. Is there any way you could do a stream where you read the fan fiction screenplay? Oh, no, I did read this. So, yes, I did read that, Mr. Aldrich. I, um, 
Uh, I thank you for that. I did answer that just the other day. So I will move on. Now, this is an interesting one. Uh, this is from Stephen Goggin. And Stephen Goggin um, is an on a long-time imagination connoisseur. Dear Rob and fellow listeners, one of the things I collect, being a new ager, is tarot card decks. I have the classic Rider Waite and Aleister Crowley Toth decks. I also have the Lord of the Rings tarot by Terry Donaldson and the Tarot of the Witches, as featured in the James Bond film Live and Let Die. I discovered that the Spanish artist Salvador Dali was supposed to make the original tarot deck for Live and Let Die, but as far as I know, Dali was late in submitting his deck for publication. Dali published his deck anyway. So, as I'm writing, I'm noticing that two of my favorite movie franchises have tarot card decks connected to them. I have a question for you, Rob, and the listeners. I am trying to find, but so far have not been able to locate any Star Trek tarot card desks, decks. Does such a thing exist? Yours truly, Stephen Goggin, the Irishman in Somerset. What an interesting question. Uh, Stephen, I don't know the answer to that. Maybe any imagination connoisseurs out there might. Does anyone know of Star Trek tarot decks? Um, that would be really interesting. I wonder what would be the pictures on Star Trek tarot decks. That's very strange. Um... I don't know. That is a very, very good question. Um, this one is also interesting. Here's another uh, letter. This comes from Logan George. And Logan George says, The last two shows you've done have been great. He's referring to um, my reviews of the Duel of the Fate script. You've done a man's job, sir, which is, of course, a Blade Runner reference. By the way, just for fun, imagine how J.J. would have done Blade Runner 2049. It's an easy thought experiment. After Roy Batty killed Terrell and J.F. Sebastian, Roy downloaded his mind into a Terrell main computer. Now in 2049, he's going to obtain a body and finish what he started. Detective K works for Gaff. Deckard's apartment has been sealed for 30 years, and there's a wayfinder in the apartment. K needs to find Deckard and Deckard's child. Then the climax takes place on the roof of the Bradbury building. See, it's easy to jj fi anything. Duel of the Fates sounds so much better than The Rise of Skywalker. Sure, it needed rewriting to account for Carrie Fisher's passing, but the story beats are solid. Why Kathleen Kennedy and Disney didn't like it? The reaction to The Last Jedi and Solo must have made them flummoxed and gun-shy. And this is really troubling. Chris Terrio has done several interviews saying they didn't look at Derek and Colin's script, and any similarities are a coincidence. He's effing lying. Kylo goes to Mustafar and gets a holocron, which looks just like a wayfarer. He sees Palpatine. He steals living force energy, which is just like force healing. You said his scars are healed when he takes Rey's energy. In The Rise of Skywalker, Kylo Kylo's scar is healed when Rey heals him after they fight. Palpatine grew new fingers when he absorbs the dyad. It sounds like a lot of the Tor Vellum and Mortis stuff got turned into Palpatine and Exegol. Lando and the smuggler fleet, instead of Finn meeting ex-troopers on Coruscant, he finds ex-troopers on Endor's Ocean Moon, and on and on. I wasn't a big Rose Tico fan, but J.J. did her dirty. Yeah, if she reads Derek and Colin's plans for her, she'll have every right to be upset. There are so many plot points in common. They're lying when they claim they didn't use his script, and apparently the WGA agreed. I kind of like The Rise of Skywalker as a fun romp, but it didn't make one lick of sense. Duel of the Fates makes perfect sense. So, of course, Dizzy said, nope, we can't have that. It's stunning. Logan. Well, Logan, uh, you're not wrong. You're not wrong about that. Not wrong at all. I was actually quite surprised after listening to their uh, all the promotional interviews that they were giving because clearly they did read the uh, script. And, of course... They didn't admit that they did. Look, there's one thing that people have to understand about the motion picture business. Authorship of a screenplay when you're a WGA member is very, very lucrative. Um, getting that money, getting that screen credit, not having to share it, it means a lot. And that's why there's arbitration, because many different times, or many, many times now, especially today, 
usually you seldom get a script from a studio film where it's just one or two writers. There's usually other drafts, and they have to go to arbitration. As a matter of fact, the WGA, there is an, I, I guess, I've never been a WGA member, but I know that an arbitration, I think, is automatically triggered. And then what happens is the script is then sent to other WGA members for analysis. But getting your, uh, if there's only two of you, you make a lot more money than if there's four. There's a lot more money in that pot. So it's uh, it's important. Um, Brian Eng writes in, longtime imagination connoisseur Brian Eng, who's always challenging me to uh, about my my own beliefs. Brian Eng says the rock and roll class of 2000 was announced today. That would be the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame class of 2000. Nine Inch Nails, the Doobie Brothers, Depeche Mode, the Notorious Big, T-Rex, and Whitney Houston are in. Dave Matthews Band, Pat Benatar, Soundgarden, Judas Priest, Kraftwerk, MC5, Motorhead, Rufus featuring Shaka Khan, Finn Lizzy, and Todd Rundgren are out. What are your thoughts? Well, I, I haven't kept up on that, but of, of the people that are in, I'm surprised, to be honest, the Doobie Brothers aren't in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Um... All of those people are, uh, I guess these are the people that are in. So we have Nine Inch Nails, Doobie Brothers, Depeche Mode, Notorious Big, T-Rex, and Whitney Houston. You know what? All of those choices are quite, they're quite fine choices. I, I Dave Matthews Band, Pat Benatar, Soundgarden, Judas Priest, I think which should be in. Kraftwerk definitely should be in. Um, Motorhead, Rufus, Shaka Khan, Thin Lizzy, and Todd Run. Todd Rundgren's not in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Wow, I didn't know that. Uh, I think everybody who's in is pretty good, but as always, those omissions are uh, are shocking. They are shocking. Um, so there you go. I, I don't know what to say. Uh, <laughs> here is another one. Uh, I don't think the people... You know what? Let's face it. No one's ever going to stop talking about Star Wars. We're going to be talking about Star Wars, I think, pretty much forever. And I, it's not a bad thing. Um but we're, we're still going to be doing it for a long time. <laughs> um, yeah. Actually, no, you know what? Our boy, Emil Johansson. Emil Johansson has written in. Now, Emil has, uh, of course, he sent a video, so we know we know what Emil, what, what he is, what he looks like. And it was very nice to meet him in the flesh, which is, to, well, meet him in the flesh, if only virtually meet him in the flesh. Here's a letter that Emil, this comes all the way from Sweden. Rob, I'm going to make a prediction. I think that in the future, starting now, more and more movies are going to be movies that do not have happy endings, but are just weird. I don't know if it's a conspiracy. Maybe I'm just making it up. But I imagine a lot of movies and books and stuff have happy endings in them. Uh, they have positive messages. M um, maybe not hidden or secret ones, but they give you positive vibes of how a world could be. Or how people should act. It's not just children's books or Disney movies. You see it in Lord of the Rings with people constantly having to resist some kind of temptation and be brave, etc. But then there's fiction like A Song of Ice and Fire, where good people just randomly die or get turned to the dark side for some reason. However, these pieces of pop cultural phenomenons are not hated. Not at all. In fact, people actually like it. I like it. And I predict that more and more people are going to dare to break traditions and showcase storytelling that is darker than we're used to. I'm not one of those people that hates on big movies because they think they send some secret social justice messages, but I do like the idea of movies being way more raw and real than maybe we want them to be. That was a big reason why I liked the Joker movie. I'm actually glad it has gotten as many nominations and award as, awards as it has, because even if that movie had a main character that did awful things and it made you feel really bad after watching it, like you wanted to throw up, those movies can probably be more relatable to people than other movies where the bad guy does not get away in the end and is never treated as a main character to begin with. I don't think that means we're all savage in nature, or whatever the comedian said, but I think we all experience bad things in life, and to constantly be fed entertainment that shows almost an opposite image of that, a sort of wish fulfillment where everything is perfect, can be exhausting. To actually see stories where bad things happen can perhaps be more cathartic than a story that tries to tell you what to think and feel. Life is usually not black and white, 
So stories that reflect that reality encourages people to think more for themselves and make up their own minds about what they think is right or wrong. At least they do in my mind. I think that's overall a positive thing, even though I do appreciate it when creators are painting a nice, encouraging, and positive future. I think that there are going to be way more stories that are dark and sad in the future. But I think that's okay. Emil Johansson. Well, Emil, what a great letter. Um, you know, you're probably right about that. I, I definitely think that that is, is probably very true. Um, but I think it's cyclical. I mean, look at the science fiction of the 70s. Until Star Wars came out, almost all of the science fiction, at least in cinemas, was dystopian in nature. I mean, you look at everything from Clockwork Orange, A Boy and His Dog, The Ultimate Warrior, No Blade of Grass, the latter Planet of the Apes sequels, um, Logan's Run, Rollerball, it was it, it, Zardoz. I mean, humanity was not having a great time. <laughs> so maybe we'll see. It, it's always something that comes and goes, and uh, it's always cyclical. So you might be right about that. Uh, this next one comes from Tony uh, Mascoro. Tony Mascoro writes, Hi, Rob. I am a big observationist. <laughs> that was one I hadn't thought of before. I love that. Oh, I need Rob observationist. I need a Rob observationist t-shirt. Oh, you are all Rob observationist. Wow. Okay, Tony. Kudos to you, sir, um, <laughs> for being a Rob observationist. Hi, Rob. I'm a big Rob observationist. And as <laughs> I love that. And as such, I've noticed that you're not able to talk about Jared Leto without bringing up Mr. Nobody. It's true. I do. I love it when Rob observationists or imagination connoisseurs. So, you know, can I say Rob observationists? That seems too self-serving. I was already told that I have too big of an ego Rob casting from the Rob Observatory, bringing you Rob observations. Um, but I love Rob observationist. <laughs> I was very slightly aware of Mr. Nobody. But due to my strange Jared Leto aversion, I've not seen it. Strangely, I always seem to resist films that have Jared Leto in them, yet always end up loving everything I've seen him in. Requiem for a Dream, Panic Room, Lord of War, and Suicide Squad. I like three of those. I can't go with you on Suicide Squad. Like I said, strange. Anyway, hearing you mention Mr. Nobody so much made me think I needed to look into it. Being as I trust your judgment and share many of your tastes in film, I figured this would be something I probably would really enjoy. Little did I know that this film was written and directed by, uh, I think it's Jaco van Dormel. And if you'd mentioned that, then I somehow missed seeing it. I love Jaco's 1991 film Toto the Hero, which is great, as well as his film The Eighth Day, but especially Toto. I immediately purchased Mr. Nobody on Amazon and should have it in my hands in the next day or so. I hope you got the long version. I cannot wait to hear it. Have you seen Toto the Hero? I love Toto the Hero. What a great film. And if so, what's your opinion of it? That's my opinion of it. It's a great, great movie. I actually have, I think, I still have the Laserdisc. I love that film, and since I saw it during its original run back in 91 at the sorely missed Rialto on Fair Oaks in Pasadena, Wow, that's close to where I live. I saw so many other great foreign Indian classic films there over the years. It kills me that I don't have a copy of it, but it seems like it never got a domestic release on either DVD or Blu-ray. No, I don't think it did. Anyway, I thought I'd give a shout-out to your recommendation of Mr. Nobody, as well as giving some love to Toto the Hero. Keep up the amazing work you do, and I will be observing. <laughs> well... I want to thank you for that. Uh, a Rob observationist. Man, do I love that. Uh, and I, I, I promise I will not love it too much because then people are going to be, you know, I'll get more self-serving. Uh, I don't know what to tell people. But, um, you know, I do, I, do, I do like that very much. Um. <laughs> Stubble McShave says, The first man to pee on the moon turned 90 today who would that be is that buzz aldrin is buzz aldrin 90 uh oh once again once again we have the the uh the landscapers i don't know if there are landscapers the next door landscapers i don't know 
So if it gets a little loud, I apologize. I did not know that, but that's good to know. Joe E. sent in a tip. I watched your Hollywood Top 100 list the other day. I watched All About Eve that night. Oh my God, where has Betty Davis been my entire life? I am now obsessed. I've never watched her because I heard she wasn't nice. But she is a rock star on film. Thanks, Rob. Joe E., well, you've taken your first step into a larger world. I mean, Betty Davis is one of our... I mean, she's one of the great screen stars of all time. I am so glad you liked All About Eve. For those of you who don't know, All About Eve was in the top 100 list of films Hollywood loves. Uh, you know, I, I first saw All About Eve at USC in Cinema 190, the same class I saw Singing in the Rain at very for the first time. And I have to say that uh, it was... I'll tell you, when I was... When I was uh, we saw these movies at USC in the beautiful Norris Theater, which is like a big, it's like a real movie theater, a 500-seat movie theater. It's a standalone building on the USC campus, beautiful building. And um, I was sitting in there, and I was taking Drew Casper's class, Cinema 190, and it was the first time I'd ever seen All About Eve. I'd heard about All About, All about Eve. It's not like All About Eve's Obscure. It won Best Picture at the 1950 Academy Awards. Amazing movie. But I just sat there, and I was stunned by it. I was just stunned by All About Eve. And, you know, my class, I was just literally sitting in the... I was sitting and after... Because, you know, old movies, they didn't have long credits like they do now. A lot of the major credits, not just the top-of-the-line credits, but other credits were up front. A lot of technical credits were up front. And so the end credits at the end were, were short. And the movie was over, and I'm just sitting there. The lights come up, and everybody was gone. Everybody was gone from the theater. And I was just... I was stunned by All About Eve. Because it was so good. And it's not like, you know, when I say when I say how good it was, it's not necessarily, it's not going to, um, uh, it's not, it, it's not, it's not like it's Raiders of the Lost Ark. You know, it's all character and story. But it's just, it just blew me away. And it was so funny because I'm sitting there, I must have been sitting there for 10 minutes, just sitting, thinking there, uh, thinking about the movie. And Drew Casper was sitting, he, he, he was sitting like over by his podium. And he was just looking at me going like this. And it was like the nod of approval. Because in Cinema 190, when you talk, if I made the mistake, I didn't realize this because, you know, nobody told me, that once you speak up in his class, then he notices you and he either calls on you more. And, and it was, it was, I was a target, but I didn't realize that. But he, I mean, he likes you. He liked me. We had a really, we had a good time together. Good relationship. But he was just, because he knew. He knew the power of All About Eve. And it's, it's, you, you could, you can't not love movies and not love All About Eve. I mean, I love voiceover in movies. And All About Eve stars with a, it starts, it opens with the great George Saunders. And it's got this wraparound segment. And it's at the Sarah Sidden Society. It's like the Academy Awards of Theater in this movie. And it's not like the, the Tony Awards. It's different. But it's it's more like the what the thespians give each other and the highbrow. I don't know if this... I know that... I've, I thought I think the Sarah Sidden Society is actually real. Uh, if it's not, I, I guess I'm mistaken. But I'd like it to be real. And uh, you hear George Sanders' narration. And if you love movies, even though it's black and white, I know, take a chance. You'll get locked in. It's one of my favorite movies of all time, and um, yeah, it's so good. I am, I am glad, I am glad that you watched it, Joe E. Joey, because it's so great. Great. Uh, Hachi tipped uh, and asks me, or he says, why do people like to talk shit about Oscar front runners? You know, I think it's because when you have people that have have either got the nominations or they think they're going to get the nominations. It's a rarefied class of, uh, of film. And you know how people hate elitist. I mean, I don't understand why, for the most part, most of the films that get Oscar nods are damn good movies. We don't have, I mean, sure, someone's going to say, well, what about Crash a couple years ago or a decade ago? That wasn't deserving. Okay, Crash, admittedly, a very didactic film. Uh, certainly not subtle, subtle, subtle in any way. Um, but... You know, people don't like that because once you nominate the best films and everyone's like, oh, really? Those weren't my best movies of the year. But um, what are you going to do? 
I think that's why people like to talk shit about the Oscar frontrunners. I really do. Um, I think that uh, uh, that's it comes from that. It's either people either wanted to be nominated or they think the people that got nominated weren't deserving. You never know. It's it's one one. If it's not one thing, it's another. But um, uh, everyone likes to talk about the Oscars because again, you're talking about the best of the best. People are being anointed, and everyone's got a different opinion. That wasn't the best. Why wasn't Greta Gerwig? I've been going back and forth on Twitter with this dude talking about everybody knows Greta Gerwig should have had one of those best director nominations. And I'm like, really? Like the best director nominations are all very solid. You've got Todd Phillips, who's been honing his craft. I mean, remember Todd Phillips made a documentary called hated Gigi Allen and the murder junkies. And if you haven't seen hated, it's one of those great, like thrasher indie. I mean, Gigi Allen was a punk or figure in the punk world who would defecate on stage and wipe it all over himself. And Todd Phillips made a documentary about Gigi Allen. Yes, the man who directed Joker, who's, yes, nominated for Best Director of the Year this year. I mean, you know, did other people do those documentaries? Todd Phillips is making even people like, well, how, when was he? He was making the Hangover movies. But no, he's been honing his craft for a quarter century. So it's it's I, I love it when people are always chiming in like, he didn't deserve it, blah, blah, blah. I mean, you know... Uh, I think that's why people just, they don't like it. They're either jealous, they they think somebody else should have got it. It's just the idea that the Oscars are going to say, this is the best of the year. Whenever you say that, everybody wants to chime in and go, no, it's not. So there you go. Amelia Hansen says, you are best at pronouncing my name. Well, Emil, I I, I appreciate that. I, I, uh, Johansson just seems like uh, how it's supposed to be said. I My Swedish isn't good, so I'm sure my accent's terrible. But uh, I'm glad to hear that I'm, I am saying your name correctly. That uh, that does make me, that makes me feel good. I do, I do like to know that uh, I am in fact saying your name right because I wouldn't want to say it badly. So back to the old letters. Uh, let's see what we got next here. And man, I'm catching up. If I haven't read your letter, it's only because uh, I haven't got to it. I have been receiving a deluge of letters there's all these new subscribers and people <laughs> who are <laughs> rob observationists <laughs> so i can't say i love that word i love the idea of rob observationists but you know what i'd rather think of i i, I can't i'm never going to stop thinking about everybody here as an, you're all imagination connoisseurs you're all members of the post geek singularity as much as i like the idea of everybody here being a rob observationist <laughs> even i can't go there but i'm going to use that occasionally um, yeah. <laughs> anyway, this, uh, this letter comes to us from, he goes by the name Django Fett Unchained, writes in. It says, Rob, thank you for giving us fans a glimpse into the alternate What If Star Wars episode Duel of the Fates by Trevor Owen Connolly. One thing I've been saying for a while, which I think almost everyone agrees with, is that the sequel trilogy would have been better served if a single captain was given command of the ship throughout all three films. I completely agree with you, as Lucas had with the first two trilogies and Peter Jackson had with Lord of the Rings. Well, remember, George Lucas did not direct Empire Strikes Back or Return of the Jedi. Uh, Irvin Kirshner directed Empire and Richard Marquand directed Jedi. But George Lucas sort of, well, he didn't really oversee Empire as much as he should have, but yes. Uh, as opposed to the tug of war we got between J.J. Abrams and Ryan Johnson, I agree with you there. I'm curious to hear what your opinion on this question my two sci-fi friends and I disagree on. After seeing two J.J. Abrams Star Wars films now, plus one with Ryan Johnson at the helm, and after reading this early draft of what direction Colin Trevorrow was starting to take, do you think the best Star Wars trilogy would have been made if all three sequel trilogy films had been written and directed by J.J. Abrams, Ryan Johnson, or Colin Trevorrow? I appreciate all the great content you've been providing on your channel and look forward to seeing more in the future. Django Fett Unchained. Well, Django Fett, um, I think that's a really good question. I mean, there's nothing better than speculating on what could have been especially when you're a genre film fan. I, I honestly believe that these films would have been far better served by one director. I don't understand if you are going to make a trilogy of films, why you're not making them the way Peter Jackson made Lord of the Rings. 
um, especially when there's only two years between films. I think it would have been much better served, and they should have spent, I think Disney should have spent another year. I know it was, they acquired Lucasfilm, what, 2012? And then we saw The Force Awakens come out in 2015. But I do think that, yes, we should have, I'm all about authorship. I think the problem was they they have these three, well, now two men making these movies. And let's face it, J.J. Abrams and, and um, Connolly's, I mean, um, Terrio's script is a hybridization of what Trevor wrote. So, yes. Uh, I would like to have seen that. And I think after reading Trevorrow's draft, I think he, I mean, I, 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 I think he might have done the better job. Um, I think he might have done, because he seemed to be the person, at least based on the script that was written, especially the way it was written. Uh, you know, whether you like or object to the direction the movies went in, uh, by the way, if they had shot all three at once, Carrie Fisher would still be in them. Uh, we wouldn't have lost her. And who knows? Maybe she'd still be here. She might still be alive. Um, I, 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 that's. I do think he would have done the best job. I was not a fan of the Force Awakens, and while I enjoyed some of Rise of Skywalker, I thought I, I'm not a fan of J.J. Abrams as a filmmaker at all. I, I think he does not know. He, he obviously he brings us some beautifully realized images, but he doesn't know. I, I just don't think he knows how to tell a story. Uh, I don't think he knows how to, to, to make a movie. I've seen five of his science fiction movies, and I haven't liked any of them. And I don't, I, I think he should go back and, and do a small story of something that he's passionate about set on Earth. And I'd be curious to see, like, maybe go back and make an indie feature. Rather than starting with Mission Impossible, it would be really interesting to see J.J. Abrams go back and make a heartfelt indie movie that he felt passionate about to see if he could tell that story because I think he is through and through as he's proven, even though he wrote like regarding Henry, he's proven he's a TV writer and he's been trying to apply television writing techniques to the big screen and it just doesn't work. But um, yeah, I think Trevor o would have done the best job and I think they should have made all three at once. 100% absolutely. So, Indeed. Yeah. Uh, this, this is a good one to read. This, this is one that comes from Ivan Maris. And uh, this is sort of interesting. Um, it, I was going to read Ivan Maris's, but I just jumped out of it. I didn't mean to jump out of it, but I did. Uh, Ivan Maris says, hi, Rob, and the entire post-geek singularity community. I was watching a bunch of YouTube channels reporting a box office failure of the rise of Skywalker. While I won't get into the debate whether it's a failure or not, it most definitely is not. I noticed that everyone blames The Last Jedi and or Lucasfilm using the facts like The Force Awakens made over $2 billion, the last one should have made Avengers Endgame numbers, or similar. But nobody seems to be focusing on an event side of things. What I mean by that? Well, The Force Awakens came out in a world where we didn't expect anything Star Wars ever again. Since the announcement in 2012, the world has been on the hype about the film, or just on hype about the film. I mean, I remember seeing Facebook posts from my friends that I know for a fact they never watched any of the Star Wars films expressing their hype about the movie, just because it was trendy at the time. So for me, it wasn't a shock at all that the film smashed opening weekend numbers and at the time crossed $2 billion. I was actually more surprised it didn't get closer to the Avatar record with the start it had. So it was an event film, attracting various audiences that normally wouldn't go and watch such a movie. Fast forward to The Last Jedi. Of course, the film was divisive, and it did, did, did damage the numbers a bit, but in my opinion, not nearly as it seemed. I know lots of people that hated the film and still went to see it a bunch of times to the theaters, mostly hoping they would like it more, but the reasons are irrelevant. So hardcore fans still went to see it, lots of them multiple times. Heck, I went to see it six times, a top record for me in any film, in theaters at least. So why such a low box office compared to The Force Awakens? Well, simply put, a lot of people that went to see Episode 7 as an event thing and not as a fan didn't bother to turn out for Episode 8. I know lots of people that did that. 
The event and trend had passed, and there was nothing for them, as normally they weren't Star Wars fans. Also, in my opinion, it gained some of the new audience, as I know some people that really didn't like Star Wars in general, but they liked different aspects. They liked the different approach of The Last Jedi, but not nearly enough to make a difference. Again, fast forward to The Rise of Skywalker. Hardcore fans stayed. The numbers dropped due to the divisiveness of The Last Jedi, but still, the film was a giant fan service platter. It returned some of the audience, but not enough, hence a lower result. It will still climb slightly, but it won't reach Last Jedi numbers. Add on top of that, everyone, on YouTube and online at least, keeps forgetting that Star Wars is mostly a North American franchise. Out of top 10 worldwide box office films, only Star Wars have had 45% or more done in the domestic market. Every other film made 25-35%. to 35%. Avatar's domestic U.S. box office was just 27% of the total. 73% came from the rest of the world. For Avengers Endgame, it was 31 to 69%. The only reason why Force Awakens crossed $2 billion is because it did mind-numbing numbers domestically. Very, This is a very good point you're making. Over $900 million, making it 45% 40 of the worldwide total, something that will not be repeated in a really long time, if ever unless they bump up the ticket prices again, and anyone thinking it should have happened again with The Last Jedi and Rise of Skywalker is delusional. For the rest of the world, Star Wars is just not as popular as it is in North America, even though it has a strong, hardcore fan base. Especially in China, where the original trilogy actually never got released theatrically, so a hardcore fan base there is non-existent, and Avengers Endgame had a $614 million gross over there as part of a franchise that got almost 23 films released there, and built their fan base from scratch. To summarize, most of Star Wars fans consider that the entire world is loving the franchise and that they are expecting Avatar numbers every time a film gets released because, well, The Force Awakens almost did it, and it should be more and more. No, Episode Seven was an anomaly, an event thing that will not likely be repeated very soon, and unless Star Wars gets closer to international audiences, it will never cross $2 billion again, let alone reach Avatar or Avengers Endgame numbers. Thanks, Ivan. Um, let's see, this is an editor's note I want to throw in here. While Ivan makes some really good points about the event-like nature of the opening for Star Wars The Force Awakens, it's also important to understand the relative size of the different movie-going markets around the world. Roughly speaking, North America, that's the U.S. and Canada, Asia, Pacific, China, etc., and Europe, the Middle East, and Africa are about one-third of the worldwide audience, each at $11.4 billion, $15 billion, and $9.5 billion in box office volume last year, respectively. On a market-by-market -market basis, box office revenue breaks down as follows. 11.8%, um, or actually billions per year. 11.8 billion a year in the U.S., 9.15 billion in China, 2.9 in Japan, 1.72 in the United Kingdom, 1.58 in Korea del Sur, 1.58 in India, 1.5 in France, 1.1 in Germany, uh, 0.98 in the Russian Federation, 0.95 in Australia, and 0.87 in Mexico. So China and America have by far the biggest movie-going populations in the world, and I think that's important to remember. But still, it is a good point. It is a good point, and I very much appreciate, Ivan, you writing in. Uh, good letter. So I thank you for that one. Um, always a good thing. I learn something new every day. So thank you for that. Uh, Magic K sent in a super chat. The problem with the farewell was the director kind of lacked to make that movie relatable to the Chinese, but ironically, they made it relatable to a Western audience. Well, I think it was, it was made, um, I, I, I absolutely agree. And I think that's what they were doing. They were making it relatable to a Western audience. And um, I think that's that was one of the most important things about the film. Now, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm going to do something a little different. I'm going to read a letter that is actually a hard copy. It is a letter here that it was sent to me with a box of goodies from our boy Trinidad the Island Man. And, you know, some people have been sending things... Um, to our post office box, and it's amazing what you guys have sent me 
Uh, and I got a box of goodies from the Hawaiian Islands, where our boy Trinidad the Island Man resides. And here he is. Here is Trinidad the Island Man. And he sent me a box of his favorite chips. He sent me a box of his favorite cookies. They're all uh, Hawaiian-related. Uh, he sent me a bunch of, of other things. He very kindly sent a lay. He wanted to make sure I got laid. So thank you for that. And um, I thought that was very, very nice of him to do that. I'm going I'm to leave his uh, picture up, but I'm going to read this letter. This is a very, very nice letter, and I, I wanted to read it and share it from him. Dear Rob, or should I say the one and only notoriously, sanctimoniously R&B. That was your first and best title ever. And hey, if you can be divine now, I don't see why you can't also be sanctimonious. And you truly are notorious. Thus, it is the only one I will use for you since it is what you'd started with. I've watched Rob's Ovation since the beginning. And I watched you way back to the John Schnepp Heroes days. I was happy to see that John Campia brought you onto his show. And when you are on those are the best of his episodes. Well, thank you. Please accept my apology for not getting this letter to you and your package in time for Christmas or even New Year's, but at least I got it to you before the Chinese New Year, and that, as Willow knows, is the most important. Happy upcoming Year of the Rat, everyone. <laughs> I did not know that. Uh, I love the show, Rob, especially when you are just freestyling on your own thoughts and ideas. From the first episodes, I'm glad you cleared the air with the whole Axanar debacle. I know how it feels to get stabbed in the back by the people you work with, and I know it was not fun. I haven't checked your web page out since the early days. I enjoyed seeing the Axnar graphics and behind the scenes, and know it would have been great. As a kid, I grew up on reruns of the original series, and I learned to love the next generation after the second season, but loved Babylon 5 much more than DS9 or Voyager. But before Star Trek The Next Generation, there was Doctor Who, and I watched Tom Baker over and over, enough to make me a true Whovian, even to this day. I would like to uh, point out, this is when I'm going to give a plug for the Burnetwork.net website, where you should check out Ian Samuels' Who Views, that Ian Samuels, of course, uh, a, a massive letter writer and contributor to the channel. He has his own column on the Burnetwork.net website. It was a couple of years since listening to Kevin Smith's podcast and starting to watch his videos on Fat Man and Batman, now Fat Man Beyond, where he encouraged people with the desire to get out there and just do it. In making your own podcast or videos on YouTube, and I'm happy to say that I did just that, and I do my own movie review show called Trinidad the Island Man. I did not know that. It is a cheesy channel about, as I put it, movies, TV shows, or whatever. Basically, I just found myself wanting to recapture the joy I had talking about movies and comics or shows like I used to with my friends growing up. Unfortunately, after traveling around the world, I have long ago left those friends and had not found anyone really to discuss my thoughts on those subjects. I had the good fortune of joining the Navy for about a decade, and in addition to seeing the world at 20 knots, I went to various ports throughout the Pacific and decided to take my leave in Hawaii and have stayed ever since, leaving behind my friend in the mainland. So I started my channel, and then I saw yours, and I've loved it ever since. As I hope you can tell from some of my co uh, comments on your videos I've left, well, Rob, I just wanted to show my thanks for your efforts with your YouTube channel, and I hope you keep it going. I'm a bit embarrassed to admit that I do not send you super chats or tips, which I am happy that I don't after hearing that you only get 70% of that revenue anyway. So as a compensation, I have included some quatloos in this box, and feel free to send YouTube their cut. <laughs> uh, I enjoyed hearing the great stories of your time in Australia and New Zealand, and have found it ironic... <clears throat> That at least a few times, while you may have been in Sydney or New Zealand, I might have been there on the other side in Fremantle and Hobart, Tasmania. By the way, when the Fifth Fleet came rolling into Sydney Harbor, man, the King's Cross was just epic. Oh my god. Even your brief memories of Seoul, Korea bring back fond memories as I had the opportunity to live in Seoul for a year from 2006 to 2007. I hope that you enjoy everything in the box. As with the shirt, I hope it fits, and it is my hope that despite not always parking my shuttlecraft in the same bay as you, Rob, maybe we can still, on occasion, wear the same shuttlecraft uniform. Uh, oh, don't you think I won't. So Trinidad the Island Man did send me a, a, a an Aloha shirt with buses on it. I don't know if he's a bus driver or he runs a, a tour company, but that's what it looked like it was from, and it's epic. And yes, I will wear it. 
Just a couple of things before I wrap up this letter. My first to you, Rob. In 2010, the Sci-Fi Channel had a great X-Men-like show called Alphas. The number one season really struggled, but the two second season really shined and ended like some comics on a tremendous cliffhanger that was never continued for a season three. So it kind of worked with nearly everyone dead. A solid ending, not happy, but at least no left in limbo. Did you ever see the show, and what were your thoughts? I liked, I saw a few episodes. I didn't religiously watch it, but I, I liked what I saw. Season 2 really showed an Xavier Magneto leader dynamic that I loved. Also, before I joined the Navy, I was really into a show that started on Fox by one of the creators of the X-Files, Space Above and Beyond. Great, great show. I enjoyed the verisimilitude of the whole Marine Corps training, boot camp, and military command structure. Even the spaceships were just like destroyers and aircraft carriers in space. The gist of the show evolved around an alien invasion, but it was suggested that it may have been... Let me turn the page. It may have been gov a government hoax or corporate or government conspiracy. I, well, it, I, I, if memory serves, it wasn't. I think it made it to season two before it was canceled for going nowhere. Do you know anything of the show and what they were going to do with it and how it was going to end? Yes, because um, I, I, of course, uh, Glenn Morgan married the star of that show. And when I was writing for Sci-Fi Universe magazine back in the mid-90s, we covered that show extensively. And um, it, I think it was 95, 96, around that time. I love the show. And I don't know how it was going to end. Or like Lost, did they just jump in with no idea what they were doing with the show? It has always lingered on my mind. Finally, a silly note to end on, Rob. What are the chances that the latest James Gunn Guardians of the Galaxy movie, that James Gunn will make a nod to the future X-Men in the MCU by showing a couple of star jammers or even a few, few Shi'ar characters? I would love that if the Shi'ar Empire was in Guardians of the Galaxy. That's actually a really good idea. I think it would be a hoot if Henry Cavill shows up for a cameo as the Gladiator. Oh, he'd be great as the Gladiator. What do you think, Rob? Would that bring down the house? Thanks for listening to my rambling for a change. Sorry for the old format. Paper, paper, what is that? But I was feeling nostalgic. I look forward to the next 300 plus shows. And thanks for continuing to bring the sweat you sweaty thanks again rob sincerely trinidad the island man well let's get another look at trinidad the island man there he is and uh i have to say uh it was sir you were, were incredibly generous um with what you put in that box and i'm still eating the as a matter of fact check it out so he sent me these and he wrote, I forget what episode you showed off your affinity for chips, Rob. So here are some of my favorites. Sorry, I couldn't send you any pineapple on pizza. So he did send me, um, these are, I'd never had these, by the way. They're from the Hawaiian Chip Company. Um, and they are sweet potato and taro chips. And let me just say, Trinidad the Island Man, you scored big with me for these. As you can see, uh, I am I am rapidly going through those. Um, they're quite good, very tasty, and I do want to thank you for... I mean, it was a box full of endless goodies. And I'm not saying everybody has to do that, but it was incredibly generous what he sent and the contribution to the channel, and, and it was just fun. And, and um, uh, I did take a picture, as a matter of fact... Um, as, as a matter of fact, wait, you know what I think, I think, allow me if you'll, if you'll indulge me. So as many people know, the, the Zoe trope, Elizabeth's daughter Zoe, um, was hospitalized, let's see, um, uh, because she had a, a seizure for the first time since she was three. And um, that was a little scary. So um, let me see if I can find this. Yes, so in Trinidad, the Island Man's, um, uh, um, his box, it, there was a lay in it. You know, they, when you go to Hawaii, they give you a lay. They put a lay made of flowers. Now, it wasn't, it was a, it was a, a lay that was, um, it wasn't a lot, it wasn't real flowers. But that means that we could then, it'll stay, it'll stick around. And I, I will put the lay. You'll see the lay. But um, here's a picture. As soon as I open his box, here is a picture of Zoe Trope 
and myself. Zoe had just got out of the hospital. So there is Zoe and me, and we are there together wearing Trinidad, the island man's lay that he sent that was in his box. So there you go. Obviously, you made Zoe very happy with that, and I want to thank you. So it was very nice. Now, I'm not saying that everybody has to do that, but it was quite unexpected, and it was very nice to open that up because it was, you know, who doesn't like to get uh, boxes full of goodies? I certainly did, and it was it was amazing. Um, our man Ian Samuels is also uh, here with a letter. So he doesn't just write his, his um, column, but Ian Samuels also writes letters. Rob. Agreed that the Duel of the Fate script sounds good. It harkens back to things from the previous films and from the Legends universe, but there's a glaring plot hole that would bring the entire story tumbling down. A big part of the story, from what you have told us, is about the interactions between Kylo and Rey. An integral part of their relationship is the fact that Kylo, with the Knights of Ren, were the ones that were hunting down Rey's parents and the reason they abandoned her to keep her safe. This does not work within the timeline. Ben Solo becomes Kylo Ren just five years before the events of The Force Awakens. That's nine years after Rey's parents abandoned her. It is impossible for it to be Kylo Ren and the Knights of Ren being the ones hunting down and killing Rey's parents. So, when Rey insists she cannot forgive him for what he had done to her family, and that the fact that he had killed her parents, it's impossible, and it leaves not just a hole in the plot, but a yawning chasm, if not a plot black hole, that swallows the entire story into it. Well, Ian, you could be correct, um, but I would say that in this case, um, maybe they would have fixed that in a new draft. I mean, obviously, there, 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 um, there might have been cooler heads might have prevailed when it came to that. I, I, I don't know to be honest, um, but you're right. I mean, that did bother me. I, you know, I, I didn't think the script was perfect, but I also didn't. Um, uh, I didn't, it wasn't something that I bumped on right away. I probably would have if, like you, I had uh, thought about it more. But anyway, we have a uh, another Super Chat came in from John Evanoff. Hey, Rob, did you hear the new rumor that Christian Bale will play Norman Osborn in Thor 4? I don't know if I believe it, but damn, would that be cool. Well, for those of you who might not keep up with your comics lore, Norman Osborn ended up leading the Dark Avengers. And I could totally see them going down that road. Um, they've already brought... They're building Asgard on Earth, and I could see them going down the whole... One of my, I love the siege. In the comics, Asgard was brought down to Oklahoma. Can't even get into why, but it was... And Norman Osborn ended up leading the Dark Avengers after the secret invasion. A lot of shenanigans were going on. But it was really, I, I thought it was really interesting. And I could see Norman Osborn usurping the Avengers if they decided to go down that route. And if he is going to play Norman Osborn, that means that Norman Osborn is going to become a player in the MCU. Maybe an ongoing bad guy, which is something that they haven't had before. And if he establishes the Dark Avengers, that could actually be something that could be very, very cool. And I would definitely be down with something like that. Um, I mean, that would, that's, I think that's, that could be great. But I, I didn't know. I mean, I, I haven't heard that rumor. Um, that, that could be great. I, I, I would be into it. I mean, he'd be a great Norman Osborn. You know, nor, uh, sort of a cross between Patrick Bateman and Lex Luthor. <laughs> It'd be awesome. Rob, Star Wars has always been a part of my life. By the way, this comes from RJ. Rob, Star Wars has always been a big part of my life for 45 years and three kids later. The epic sagas have definitely become culture to me. This seems, however, to come at a cost. Picking apart every last detail, only to complain about what does or doesn't make sense. Yet, when my 12-year-old son watches Ray. Uh, line a dagger up to a section of the Death Star that was previously blown to particles, he just says, cool, what I'm saying to myself, how? I envy this, because I remember a long time ago when Star Wars was just cool. So I've decided to calm my dark side. 
subjective ways and watch Star Wars through the eyes of my children. Now, in the end, perhaps I'm watching Star Wars in the way it was intended, and that's cool to me. RJ, shame on you. No, it's not cool when that dagger lines up. That means somebody who actually carved that dagger was standing at that same place. It's inane. It's idiotic. Don't do this to your kids. Make them demand more of their entertainment. But on the other hand, I can't disagree with your sentiment. You know, um, I know that our Star Wars was far more intelligent and made us think more than modern Star Wars. But who are we to yuck the yum of our kids? Who are we to harsh their mellow? Who are we to do those kinds of things? I'll tell you who we are. We're smart, well-adjusted individuals. And if our kids don't have our guidance to know what is good and bad, they will fail at life. So I understand your sentiment, but don't give up. Don't give in to hate. Don't give in to it. It leads to the dark side. So step on it. And when your child's a little older, you explain to him why that's inane and stupid. Uh, but, <laughs> but anyway, I appreciate you writing in. And kudos for being a good dad and sharing these things with your kids. Because isn't that what it's all about? I, I will never know the joy of, of bringing up young children and, you know, just the thought of indoctrinating them, making a young mind believe exactly what I tell it to believe. I mean, talk about making him into a, or her into a observationist. By God, that would have been amazing. I mean, can you imagine not letting your kids know anything but classic cinema and great television and awesome movies and making them read only great books? That would have been great. I think I would have been a good dad. I would have been a good dad. I would have been participatory. Dad, can we go to Toys R Us again? Yes. Yes, we can. <laughs> now there's no more Toys R Us. It's very sad. It's very sad, but what are you going to do? And um, speaking of that, Calvin Bose is here with a similarly themed letter. Um, Rob, I am 59 years old, and I was thinking of things I miss about going to the movies when I was younger, as opposed to today. First of all, I love the age. My age, I think I got one of the, the most wide varieties of ages of people that watch my show, and I'm very proud of that. Number one, I miss when the average movie theater was a grand theater with ushers, with white gloves, and red flashlights, and not a multiplex. I miss double features. I miss the cartoon before the movie. I miss that you could come in when you wanted, I miss that if you like the film, you could sit through it again. Larger screens on average and beautiful curtains. I remember these things and I miss them. When I was 12, I saw my first James Bond movie, Live and Let Die. When you were young and your heart was an open book, you could see Live and Let Die. I went to the Chinatown Theater and I saw it three times a day all summer. <laughs> it was great. You can't do that anymore. Now when you go to a movie... You're herded in like cattle. You see the movie on a smaller screen, and then you're herded out of the film, and now instead of a cartoon, you get a bunch of commercials and have to pay ten times more for that experience. Do you remember these things? Calvin B. Yes. I mean, you know, there were ushers, but we didn't really have ushers in the in the zoot suits and the hats. and the. We had some, but I didn't really have that. But, yeah, the in Seattle – my favorite movie theaters were the grand movie houses. The John Dan's that I talk about was in Bellevue. Downtown, we had my beloved UA-150. Across the street, there was the King. There was the Music Box. There was the Town, which was a 70-millimeter theater. There was more of a grindhouse, the Coliseum, that had seen better days. But again, a giant theater with a giant screen. And by the way, I did see Roller Coaster in Sense Around four times there uh, because it was awesome. And uh, I miss those houses, those big movie houses. And then, you know, my teenage years were, were filled with like the Factoria Cinemas was the first multiplex, but it was only three theaters. It's still there. And it had big, big screens. They were big theaters, big auditoriums. So you felt good about those. I don't know if they added more screens. I have not gone to Factoria. I haven't seen a movie at Factoria in, in since I moved to L.A. Next time I go to Seattle, I think I'm going to have to go to the Factoria Cinemas and see what's up. See if the projection still is good. I mean, in terms of multiplexes, it was really great. Then we had the Uptown that was in downtown Seattle by the Se Seattle Center over on Queen Anne Hill. Yeah, I don't, the, the, all of those, almost all of those theaters, the big houses are gone, you know, and, and it's, it's too bad. And I, I, I feel your pain, man. I feel your pain. 
And um, yeah, that that's I'm right there with you. I am right there with you. It bums me out, but you know, change is inevitable. What can we do about it? I don't know. Well, uh, let's see. Do I have another? You know what? I think I'm going to leave it here. I think I'm going to leave it here. We had some technical snafus at the beginning. I'm going to blame the dogs because it was, after all, their fault. Um, I, I, I cop to when I'm incompetent. I do. I have no problem saying that I was incompetent. I'll cop to that. But I, I want to uh, bring an end to Rob Observations, episode number 324. I want to thank everybody for participating. Uh, as you all know, if you want to send me letters, please send them to the burnetwork.net website. You can also send me videos there. Um, or as this video, as Bo did, he put this video in a private link on YouTube, and I was able to download it and convert it and play it on the show. Now, if you want to do that, remember, I don't want to use, I can't have music that'll get me a copyright strike. This was YouTube licensed music. I hope YouTube recognizes that, but I love that video. I want to hear, you know, send me more videos and, um, it, it's great to hear from you guys. So thank you very much for that. I also want to thank my great moderating staff, the great Mayor Mike Bodden of Riverdale, Iowa. Of course, our favorite detective, former detective, former cop, uh, Detective Jim Boyers. And, of course, I oft, I can't mention you know Greg Smith without saying that he can build his own houses. And also, he's building a snowspeeder, a one-to-one scale snowspeeder from The Empire Strikes Back. And then, of course, we have Louis Yu and Jordy Lyons bringing up the rear, our newest moderators and i want to thank them for all the work they do most of all i want to thank you guys for being here uh this channel is because of you now that you've all become observationists <laughs> uh but anyway don't worry i'm not going to incorp well maybe a little but i want to thank you members of the post geek singularity all of you imagination connoisseurs that make the show what it is uh, i'm going to bring an end to this show hopefully i will be back on the sean campy show tomorrow and some of you, by the way, have written to me about Tango Shalom tickets in New York being able to come see the movie on Sunday night, and I will be getting back to you today. So thanks for the inquiries, and um, I still haven't decided on if I've got time to have a meetup or something like that, but maybe. Uh, it's great to hear from you all, and as always, remember, every person you meet has a story to tell that you have yet to hear. All you have to do is listen oh look at wait look who shows up bringing up the rear look at comes a oh, homeboy all right all right since they're here since they've you've been polite okay all right that's fine all right gilbert is here to say goodbye here you go buddy and Tallulah. Tallulah has a bone in her mouth and Tallulah, you got to take the bone out of your mouth before you can have a cookie, a cookie come on come over here come here Tallulah. well you got to see her boy what, what people would think that people don't feed you buddy they don't feed you. Do people feed you? We do. You get the gourmet. You get the best dog food ever. No, 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 no. This no, 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 no. You can't take stuff. No. I know. He loves my desk. But anyway, every person you meet has a story to tell. You have yet to hear. All you have to do is listen. And with that, Tallulah, Gilbert, and I uh, apparently bid you a farewell, don't we? Yes, we do. Okay, you can have one cookie. You want one cookie? There you go. All right, everyone. Thanks for everything. I'll be back tomorrow. Have a better day.